I would be doing it today, but I'm doing this show. Well, then you made a really bad decision. I'll tell you that right now. Like That was a bad call. I mean, I appreciate it, but that was a bad call on your part. Hey, everybody. What's up? Trey Wingo here. Welcome into the season finale of Half Forgotten History. And if we're going out, we want to go out with a bang, and we brought in a big name. Yeah, that's right. We've got a Manning on the show. No, 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 not Peyton Manning. I mean, that guy's doing everything from bar mitzvahs to mall signings. So he's the easy get. We got the good get, the better get, the one that got a shout out from President Obama recently on the Manning cast, Cooper Manning, the firstborn of Archie and Olivia and the guy who was supposed to be the trailblazer in the NFL for the next generation. And it just didn't work out. But it's safe to say he's blossoming now. Please enjoy our conversation with Cooper Manning. So I feel like as the firstborn son, you're getting your center stage now way past everyone else's football career. Because when you talk to anybody, including former President Barack Obama, the guy they mention isn't Peyton or Eli, it's Cooper in the Caesars ads. I mean, I'm overdue, Trey. It's about time. I got, you know, it's time for my little little glimmer of sunlight to hit right on this big schnoz. So it works out just great. Familiar, by the way, I understand. Um, so, what what was your reaction when you heard that from Obama on the on the Manning? You know, I was out of town and I was trying to find something to eat in Minnesota. I was shooting a Manning hour, and I wasn't even watching. I was always at a bar trying to get him to turn the Manning cast on. And I was just listening to good old fashioned yeah. Troy and Joe, and my phone started lighting up. Like, do you know Obama? How does he know you? I'm like, I have no idea what the heck's going yeah. on. So. Um, and then odd, odd, oddly enough, or ironically enough, the next week, I literally go to Dallas with Peyton and um, with my Eli and my dad for a little speaking engagement. And we got invited over to the Bush Library to have a little meet and greet with George Bush. So within about three days of one another, uh, I'm, uh, I'm peacocking around with, uh, you know, America's finest. Well, that's pretty cool. Now, I have never met uh, former President Obama, but I was uh, at the Dallas Country Club a couple of years ago with some buddies of mine having dinner, and former President Bush walks in with Laura, and they're sitting at the at their table. We're sitting at our table, and as I go to leave, I just look over, and he gives me one of these, he goes, oh, <laughs> and walked out. So so I didn't quite go to the library, but he recognized my existence, and I was okay yeah, with I, it. I, that was the first time I'd ever met him, and literally after we spent an hour um, just – talking and he's very up to speed on sports and what's going on and yeah, i feel like i feel like i had known him for 30 years he was really really uh kind and nice and just made 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 a guy who's probably a little nervous feel pretty comfortable yeah you never know how to react about someone who's had the football for lack of a better term being the, the thing with the nuclear codes not not the football that everyone else knows but the actual really important football um speaking of that let, let's go back to the beginning because you were the firstborn of this sort of, you know, hierarchy of the uh, the quarterback Hall of Fame family that we're dealing with, with your dad and Peyton and and Eli. What was it like for you? Because I, I've talked to Eli on this podcast before, and he's like, I never really saw my dad play. He's like, to me, he was the radio guy, you know, and I saw, you know, I, I remember him being on the radio. I never really saw him play. So what was it like for you being the firstborn and, and seeing the things that your dad was doing? It was a great way to grow up. It was, um, it was fun. I mean, we... Um, I think we quickly realized, at least I did, that my dad did something differently than my friends, you know, parents. The, you know, when people are asking for autographs at, at lunch, you kind of get a sense that my dad's not a doctor or a lawyer because those guys weren't getting quite the attention they probably deserve. But uh, we went to practice a lot. We would go and um, and I think probably uh, we probably were probably not supposed to be there a little bit. I mean, we would go to always go to Saturday right. practice. We were really close with the trainer and the equipment guy. They would kind of babysit us. We'd get taped up, um, you know, always have shoulder pads on, running around. So it was a really cool way to go to go to work with your dad and then go to Sundays. And I know mom would be kind of stressed out. We weren't very good. So Saints were getting, you know, booed. Yeah. And, but it was, a, it was a really neat way to grow up. Right. But I think what you just said is really interesting because, you know, everyone thinks of they see Peyton's career and they see Eli's career. And for people that don't understand – Archie's career, uh, the late, great Steve Sable did an NFL Films thing on Archie, and I think he said it best once in terms of the team. He said, if Peyton is the best of the best, 
then Archie might have been the best of the worst in, in terms of the teams that he played for. He played for so many different head coaches. The, the, the Saints organization was kind of always in, you know, in turnaround. And um, the best year they ever had was eight and eight. And he was NFL, NFC player of the year. I mean, he went to the Pro Bowl twice and without a winning record. So it was when they took two quarterbacks back then, the Pro Bowl meant something. Right. So he was definitely yeah. um, having a, a darn good career, but it was challenging because the team just wasn't so hot. Did he ever sort of relay some of that frustration to you, or did he try and shield <laughs> you guys from that completely? He was pretty good about not bringing that home. I mean, I know he was frustrated. I know he's a competitive guy, and he, he's still a competitive guy, doesn't matter what you're doing. But I know he, it yeah. killed him inside, but he was definitely um, – um, I never knew him anything but the kind, sweet dad I'm lucky to have. Yeah, he, he, look, he, he's always been great to me, so I, he, he's he's been fantastic. So when did you start to think, okay, my dad played. I'd like to think about playing football. My dad was great about playing sports with us, whether we were, you know, shooting yeah. hoops in the backyard or, you know, I don't care if it was t-ball, softball, tennis, golf, football. We were always – his his time at home leisurely was outside playing. It was not video games. We were always – we had a big yard across the street. A buddy of mine had a yard, and it was kids playing. And either my dad was filming or he was permanent quarterback. So we always – sports were important to us. And the goal of my life and since I was, I don't know, four or five, was to try to play college football. That was about the coolest thing someone could do, and that was about as far of a dream as it could be to play college football somewhere. And we grew up um, – you know, I think sometimes maybe those – those days of my dad at Ole Miss were put on a little higher pedestal because they were winning and they were good. And he was up for the Heisman Trophy and he was an All-American. Right. And the Saints, the pro was, was challenging and harder. So the idea of getting to college at the time might have been even more of a, you know, a higher mountain to climb. But that was, that was the goal in life. And we always um, wanted to play sports and football seemed to be the kind of the leader in the clubhouse. Well, it was interesting watching the book of Manning because he did film everything. And was Peyton really that whiny? Like, was he really that whiny all you know, the time? You know, it's funny. Peyton gets so frustrated because he's like, at, at, <laughs> at what point does dad drop the camera and like, you know, maybe tend to the son who's getting his head beat in by his older brother? Like, no, no, no. Don't want to miss this. This might be on a documentary one day. Well, Cooper is just kicking him in the ribs as hard as he can at six, kicking the four-year-old. But... Uh, it was, there was that yeah. old school, I'm sure you remember those, those cameras weighed about, you know, 200 pounds. You right. brought the actual physical, yeah. you know, put the VHS in and stuff. The cable right. and the thing off the shoulder. So it wasn't like yeah. really easy to go ahead and press pause and deal with it. It was like, you know, you were truly an, an equipment man. So it's like, look, unless there's, you know, blood and guts, I think I'm just going to keep rolling. Yeah. Yeah, suck it up, Peyton. Come on, I, I, let's go. I'd like, I'd like um, to, I'd like to attribute some of Peyton's toughness. Uh, I think Dad and I had a lot to do with that. Me beating him up, and Dad just not letting it stop. Right, filming, filming it. it. Yeah, Dad Perfect. filming it. Right. It needs yes. to be documented. <laughs> so when you started playing, obviously at, at, at organized level, you thought I got to be a quarterback because my dad was a quarterback, right? That was kind of the, the deal. I mean, we could always uh, throw it pretty good, and. Um, yeah, I mean, you were, I was always a quarterback at recess, you know, growing up in lower school and what have you. So yeah. it was a natural um, progression into, uh, you know, we were not, dad did not let us play tackle football until his, his rule was, you know, you had to wait until you play school football, which was started at sixth grade. And then uh, he got traded to the Vikings and I was in fifth grade and we were going to go move to Minnesota for the football season. And I checked into it and I, we didn't want to go really. And, I looked into it, and that school we were going to up in Minnetonka, Minnesota, Tanglin Elementary School, yeah. offered football in the fifth grade. And I went, I was became a Minnesota fan overnight. I said, I'm going, Dad. I'm going if I, you know, if I cut a deal. So he let me play football, tackle football in fifth grade, and uh, and uh, it was a blast. So I, you know, that was that was the beginning of it. And you you played there, and then obviously you guys came back to New Orleans because you played at Isidore Newman, like uh, right. Peyton and Eli, and Odell Beckham Jr. By the way, also an Isidore Newman uh, sure. graduate. So when did when did you realize, okay, like 
I love the fact that I can play quarterback and I want to be like my dad, but I'm not sure that's going to really work out. Right. So I played obviously fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth, ninth grade quarterback. And then as a 10th grader, I looked on the depth chart. There was a senior captain who was a good player who was a starter. There was another guy ahead of me who was a good friend. And so I kind of found myself, look, I don't want to just sit on the sideline. So I went out for receiver that year as a 10th grader and had a, um, had a good year, had a productive year. And then the next year, I really liked wide receiver. I guess I, yeah. I had spent so much time catching balls in the yard and running routes for my dad that I really kind of, I don't know, I just, I really liked it more than, than, than the quarterback. And so that next year, I had a really close friend. I said, you want to play receiver? You'll play quarterback. He goes, like, I'll play receiver. He goes, I'll play quarterback. And we had a great year, and he threw me a bunch of touchdowns. And the next year was my senior year, and Peyton was coming up as a sophomore, and we got to play together, which was a blast. And Newman had not had great football teams. We had had real good basketball teams. We'd won state championship my junior and senior year in, um, in high school. But football was kind of – we were middle of the road. And then that year, um, they, they changed the offense and started airing it out a little bit. And this is still when people ran it a little bit more than they probably should. And so Peyton, as a sophomore, was throwing to me, and I think he threw me 73 balls. And we had we got beat in the last seconds of the semifinals of the state championship. So it was a, a really fun year. Yeah. Well, tell me about that. Like, how early did you guys realize when he was – because he started as a sophomore, as you said, and you were a senior. Did you guys realize, okay, he might be really, really good at this? I think the first indication was when I was sending out my film to some coaches and they go, yeah, that's a nice looking, you know, 6'4", 185 pound wide receiver. But who's this skinny 160 pound guy <laughs> putting it right there every time? I'm going, wait, this is about me, guys. So, um, you know, Peyton was Peyton was driven. He was pretty, he's not, not a whole lot different than he is there. He was hard headed and tough and, and uh, wanted to be great. And so he didn't, you know, he wasn't a, guy was running around all over the place, but he was very accurate and um, he was probably 160 pounds. So, you know, you didn't, no one ever bets on a guy who's 160 pounds that this is going to be a, a fantastic player. But uh, anybody that knew anything about football, which is usually not very many people in a high school stadium, uh, could tell right. they were, they were onto something. Well, it's interesting. I was talking to your dad at the Hall of Fame and when Peyton got inducted uh, last year and we did a little sit down and he, he, he told me, he said, all these people just come and say, hey, Peyton's going to be really, really good. He's going to play in college or he's going to play in the pros. And your dad's like, how the hell do you know? Shut up. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> I know. You know, I think anybody who gets, you know, you don't ever want to sound like that crazy parent. Like I right. got a really good one right here. I mean, you, you do because you yeah. sound crazy no matter what, whether you got a good one or not. But, uh, I don't think uh, there was any doubt he was going to be a, uh, he was, he was a, it was a lot of fun to play, play with. And uh, I wish I could have done it more because it was, uh, it was, it was one of the most fun year. It was the most fun year I've ever had in organized sports. And I think my parents would say one of their, one of their most fun. And I'm, I'm kind of living it right now, having two boys playing the same team. And I'm, it's been the best year of, uh, of being a, of being a fan. I can, I can never recall. Well, listen, I, I can relate to that. I had no appreciable skill, and my son went on to play college football at, at Georgetown, so like, I get it. And I, sometimes I feel like I kind of was that dad, so I, I like apologize to everybody because I, so, I was so fired up because I sucked at everything athletically. I was like, yeah, that's my guy. That's my it's, guy. So I get it. I get yeah. it. Um, so you decided to follow in your dad's footsteps <clears throat> and, and try to play f college football at Ole Miss. Why did you decide to go down that road instead of trying to go somewhere else? You know, I had a, I had a, I did, I got recruited, not huge. I had offers like to yeah. Texas and UVA and some other, you know, the two lanes and North Carolina States and some stuff, but recruiting was entirely different back then. Um, Ole Miss was early to me. They offered me and I had a few other things that kind of, I don't know, didn't pan out like I'd like. And, and so um, at the end of the day, I, I was comfortable at Oxford. Uh, I had a good relationship with uh, the head coach, Billy Brewer at the time. And, I knew I could go and compete and try to have a, you know, have a fun, productive college career. Um, and, you know, I wasn't, um, I, it wasn't like today, these days where you like yeah, taking a thousand visits and going to see everything. It was like, you go up there one time and make a call. And go, All right. It's like, it was like, yeah. it was like, what am I going to have for lunch tomorrow? It wasn't, it wasn't as, yeah. you know, so, um, but I, 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 uh, I had a great four years in Oxford. Yeah, it's, it's interesting that you mentioned Texas. We'll, we'll come back to that a little mm. bit later because it has another thing to do with your family. Well, I, I can tell you, um, I got offered, I, it's funny, I got offered a scholarship for Texas 
and I was going on my visit. And on the Wednesday before my Friday visit, they fired um, they fired David McWilliams and hired John McAvick. And yeah. I call, and I said, Coach, uh, Coach McAvick, I called. He called. I said, I'm supposed to come here in two days. What am I supposed to do? And he goes, Well, you know, we got enough slow, you know, tall white receivers right now. We might we might. <laughs> Take take a look around. I went. I get it. So I got to yeah. put that on pause, and that, that made the Ole Miss offer look a lot more uh, intriguing. Yeah. So people might not even know this part of your story. So you go to Old Miss, and you're going to be a wide receiver. And very early on in practice, you begin to notice some things that aren't right. How early on did you feel like, wait a minute, something's not working here? Well, I had had a little surgery in the spring of my senior year. And I I started losing feeling in my in my hands in my fingers like kind of pins and needles and numbness and lost a little strength and so but I got cleared to go I played in the uh, Louisiana high school all star game which was littered with talent with some guys sure. a bunch of guys who played professional and then uh, went up to Ole Miss and went through two a days and you know dressed uh, I remember I dressed for a game and then the the trainer there just started kind of monitoring my situation. He's like, this doesn't look right. Let's just, let's, let's pull out here and go and go see some, some experts and look around. And then that's when they came to, you know, to the, kind of did some more MRIs and um, things on my neck and realized that this wasn't, uh, this wasn't something that was going to get better. This was something that was uh, you're born with that didn't, didn't need to be, no one need to be going across the middle or getting hit again. Otherwise it could have been, um, far, far worse than, uh, than we could ever even imagine. For those that don't know, you had a c- case called spinal stenosis, which is the narrowing of the spine, which means the, the spinal cord is more likely to be to hit. And if it's hit, it's really bad. In fact, Michael Irvin, that's what ended Michael Irvin's career uh, in the pros. He took a hit uh, against the Eagles and he went down on the field and they, they never diagnosed it on him until, you know, he was 10 years, 12 years into the league, and he had to retire immediately. But but yours was a little different, right? Because it was a condition that normally comes on when, when someone's in their mid-60s, and it happened to you when you were 18. No, I, I don't really think that's it. I think anybody could, you know, can live with this and be fine and never have any sort of yeah. issues unless you start getting hit a lot. And I think that was yeah. mine was kind of wear and tear of football. So, I mean, if you're a – you know, a lady down the street or a, a guy who's a tennis player or a golfer, you live for, fine forever. You sometimes yeah. might find out the hard way if you're, you know, getting to an auto accident or, a you know, water skiing. So I was fine to do it. it was, football kind of started to bang it, bang it around a little bit, and there, therefore the, the writing was on the wall. But, yeah, Michael Irvin and I, had, he, got, he got lucky and got 12 years right. of, of pro football in, and I think he probably counts his blessings every day that he's walking around and feeling good. But they caught mine at, at 18 before my career even started. So that had to be tough, right? Because you wanted, obviously you'd seen what your dad had done. You've seen the accomplishments that he'd had and the, and the accolades, not, not only at Old Miss, but as you said, went on to play professional. When you're 18 years old and you hear that news, how do you process it? Well, I, that's the hard part, Trey. You, you go to college kind of, you know, as a football player, you go to college to play football. I mean, you're trying to get an education, make friends, and have a normal life. But that's certainly a driving force in why you're there. And so that was challenging because, you know, I was living in the athletic dorm. I was going to practice every day. All my friends were on the football team. They go, nope, can't do this anymore. And you're going, wait, hang yeah. on. And so it was an adjustment. I am um, I would say I'm kind of wired to be pretty rosy about things. And grass is green right where I am. And so uh, it took me a little while. I think there was – I had an older player who told me one time, like, why do you keep coming to practice? You could be doing all kind of other stuff. You should be playing golf or going fishing or chasing girls or right. whatever. And I was like, okay, maybe you're right. And I don't think, I think after he told me that, I don't think I ever went back to practice. I went and had a great time and just became a college student and got to do all these things that football players don't get to do. But um, it was, uh, it was an adjustment and, you know, just like anybody, they have, you have bumps in the road, you, you go over them and make the best and, and keep moving. That's pretty rare, though, right? I mean, especially for guys that are really, I mean, I, I would say that a lot of people would not be able to make that transition as easy as you did because they have this dream. They have this passion. It's everything that they've known. I'm not saying it's everything that you knew, obviously, right. but I, I do think your ability to handle that is more unique than I think most that even maybe you realize. Maybe so. I, you know, I don't, 
I don't dwell on bad news. I don't like bad news. I don't like yeah. being around. I don't like going to funerals. I don't like saying goodbyes. I'm kind of a, yeah. just a, I like the good stuff. So I'm, I probably compartmentalized it somewhere and it's hidden back there. And one day when I'm 80, I'm going to break down and start crying a lot. But uh, in yeah. the meantime, I've just tried to have as fun and productive and as, uh, as good of a life as, as, as the hand I'm dealt. So I, you know, it's, it's funny, Trey, I, I get a lot of calls from, I, I I've told some people before when you Google spinal stenosis or neck yeah. injury or football, injury, I must pop to the top of the list because I get called a lot, especially by parents and the parents are the ones that seem to have a harder time with their children, not being able to play sports than the actual kid. Kids are resilient. They're tougher. They recognize yeah. there's something else out there for them, but I get called a lot and, um, and I like, I will, I will stop what I'm doing and always, you know, I get letters, whatever, and call people and talk. I want to talk right to the child. I mean, I'm like, you know, I don't care whether you're 15 or you're, you know, a junior at University of Florida and having a great all American career and it's over. I like to talk to them and, and be there for them. And I've, I've done that and I've really enjoyed, made some really good relationships off some guys that had to, had to have their career, you know, cut short. So, um, uh, I'm there for those guys. Has the has the the illness or the stenosis affected you in any other way going forward? Um, yeah, I mean, yeah, I'm just, I'm just, you know, I'm not the athlete I would have been going forward. I had to have surgery, and then surgery was a kind of a, I had a few hiccups there, I had a blood clot, things didn't go right. I had to learn how to walk all over again, and went from wheelchair to walker to cane to so just you know pain in the ass stuff. And, uh, yeah. but you know, whatever, I mean, I'm, I'm alive. It's not cancer. I'm, I'm going to, you know, I've got, I've had a, I've had a, I've had a, a good run. So, I mean, I, I, I wouldn't, you know, I wish I could go shoot hoops and go beat people like I thought I could beat them, but I can't. So I just, yeah. I play golf and I, you know, drink a few cold beers. That's uh, never a bad thing. Either one of those things. And together yeah. they're fantastic. That, that, I, I want to be clear you know, about that. I would be doing it today, but I'm doing this show. Well, then you made a really bad decision. I'll tell you that right now. Like that was a bad call. I mean, I appreciate it, but that was a bad call on your yeah. part. Well, uh, why don't we take our first break here? We'll come back with Cupper Manning. Cupper, as they say, cu- in the Manning. Cu- cu- Cupper. 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 We're back on this episode of Half Forgotten History. Stay with us. You know, you open up a Mercedes-Benz Sprinter and you're opening more than doors. You're unlocking potential to do your own thing, be your own boss, and live out your own dreams. With 16 body types, your choice of a gas or diesel engine, and thousands of ways to customize, a Sprinter van is capable and versatile enough to help you drive your ambitions as far as you want to take them. So go ahead, unlock your potential inside a Mercedes-Benz Sprinter. So, you know, back with the Cupper Manning on the Half Forgotten History here. So you went out of your way to write a letter to Peyton after your playing career was done because of the spinal stenosis. And you basically said to him, hey man, I got to live this through you now. And I had a great time living it. You know, I must say, I I had more fun going to Peyton's games um, in in Tennessee and Indianapolis and on the road and Super Bowls and and same for Eli. I, I was, you know, I I think there are probably some people out there that don't get to play anymore and get mad at the sport and get jealous. And I was, I was not wired like that. I love football today more than I did when I was playing. And I'm, I'm a huge fan and I like people to have um, success. And I was fortunate enough to be um, a fan of, of two guys that had more success than most people get to have. And so I, I consider myself lucky and I was there. And I, I mean, my Sunday nights and Mondays were awful when they didn't win and they were, you know, fantastic yeah. when they, they did. So I, I definitely grinded out every single win and loss alongside him as best I could. Why was it important for you to put that in a letter to Peyton? You know, my dad kind of comes from a, a, a letter writing style, you know, thank you notes yeah. and Peyton just kind of carried that on. And maybe I didn't have exactly what it took to say it to him. And, and I kind of wanted to, um, I guess, make it last a little bit more, you know, we're not, yeah. I'm not you know, texting and emails and, aren't quite as good. A, a, a handwritten note seems to mean a little bit more. And so uh, I don't think I was that mature at the time, but I'm, I, I guess I had a, one little glimmer that made it uh, I get a little more memorialized. 
No, that, that's the old phrase, growing older but not up, for sure. And I, uh, <laughs> I, I, I try and personify that as much as I can as well. Um, what, so there was never a time when you saw what Peyton was doing or Eli went on to do that you were like, God, I can't believe I didn't get a chance to do that. I mean, you're, you're, I mean I'm jealous of, of people get to do fun stuff just normally, but no, yeah. not like bitter or, you know, yeah. why me? I, I don't have time for that, you know, crap. I, I'm, I would say I'm pretty insensitive to people that sit around and dwell on their, you know, wah. I just don't have time for that nonsense. We, we weren't allowed to complain a lot. I've kind of moved. I like that. You know, just, hey, yeah. no, no one cares. Quit feeling sorry for yourself. You know, get, get going here. There's, something, there's plenty of other stuff to do. Let's go. You know, I, yeah. I'm, not, I'm not wired like that. I don't, have, I don't want to be around people that are like that. And I don't right. have patience for that sort of stuff. So you got a yeah. problem fix it. If you can't fix it, you know, let's, let's, let's find something else to do. Yeah. Time is precious and let's, let's make them, let's just enjoy while we will have this opportunity. So, uh, how difficult was it for you or, and Archie and everybody, and I've talked to Archie, I've had Archie on the show, I've had Eli on the show, by the way, I don't want Peyton on the show and I'll tell you why, like Peyton's the easiest get of all, like what he does everything. Like, I think he's doing a couple of bar mitzvahs this week and he then is. he's got a couple of holiday parties. Like I'd rather talk to the guys that are harder to get like you than Peyton at this point. Yeah, he's doing the bar mitzvah, bar rugata, alahenu, and then he's actually singing. I mean, it's amazing. He's, he's got an 80s band. It's phenomenal. Kicks little little Pat Benatar. It's phenomenal. He's, he's so, he's he's versatile. Yeah, hit him with your best shot. Um, yeah. So when, when when Peyton came into the league, obviously first year three and 13, still has the, 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 the touch, the interception record for a rookie quarterback. And then, you know, then things start turning around in Indianapolis, but then comes the climate-controlled quarterback narrative. As an older brother, like, how protective, angry did you become of the narrative around Peyton? Yeah, I would say I was, uh, I was pretty protective. But, you know, it was funny. I'm having a flashback to that 3-13 and 13 year. The Saints were horrible that year. We had a hurricane in New Orleans. Ellen and I go up to Indianapolis to go see a game and they get beat by the Saints, who was that was probably one they were supposed to win. And we were kind of stuck in Indianapolis because there was weather issues in New Orleans. And he was so miserable to be around that we just flew to Atlanta and just rode out the storm there because I couldn't be around him anymore. He hated losing so much. So that that th- three and thirteen year put some uh, gray hair on on Peyton. And then it was fun to flip it and go thirteen and three the next year, and Edron and Marvin get cranked up. But yeah, there was always. I mean, he didn't win a Super Bowl until the ninth year. So there was nine, eight years there of going, he's good, but he can't win the big one and all that stuff, which is just, you know, just makes garbage for good TV, I guess, or bad TV, bad radio shows. So yeah, just hot air. Yeah, it bothered me. And I would, you know, there was guys that were winning them that weren't doing very much. They weren't throwing for anything. They were handing off or completing, you know, going 10 for 15 and winning games that, you know, that, that didn't seem like it was fair when it was kind of all on his shoulders. So, yeah, I, I took it personally. And also sort of when Eli came into the league, there was a little bit of controversy about him as well with the whole Chargers thing and the draft. And, you know, he made it very clear that he didn't want to go there and he took a lot of heat. Were you, did you still feel that same sort of paternal or fraternal pride over, over him? Probably more so to Eli. Peyton and I are a little more peers, I would say. Yeah. Eli – is certainly my younger brother. I mean, we're seven years apart. Eli, Peyton and I are only two years apart. So I had much more of a uh, protective feel for E than, you know, I kind of knew Peyton would be fine on his own. He didn't, he didn't need me, so to speak, in my eyes, as much as I thought uh, I needed to be there for E as more of a big brother. So yeah, I was, I was more protective of Eli than, uh, and plus, you know, the, the media in New York is a lot more, uh, yeah. is a lot more rough. And so he, you know, uh, I, I felt I slept worse when Eli was getting it probably than Peyton. Listen, I, I, I had, the, I told this story. I had Eli tell the story when he was on the pod, but it's worth bringing up again. I, cause I just love it. Um, it was a game where, uh, the left tackle for the giants, uh, can't remember his name now broke his leg. He was there all the time his rookie year. And, uh, Bob Whitfield had to come in. Mm-hmm. Long time left tackle. And he was a turnstile, basically. I think Eli got sacked or hit like 12 times in that game. And the, after the game, Bob Whitfield stood up and said, hey, man, this one's on me. 
you know, the left tackle, he never gets hurt. I was up all night partying with girls. I didn't think I was going to play. <laughs> You know, and, and, you know that, sorry, man, I wasn't ready. I'm ready to go. And Eli turned to Tim Hasselbeck in the quarterback room and goes, yeah, and I'm the bust, right? And I'm the bust. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's funny how um, in the NFL in particular, I guess anywhere, no one really knows what's going on. I mean, there's so right. many things that are kept in-house that are secret that what's going on. It's, it's actually – Watching some of this HBO, these hard knocks. Is oh, my you, God. You do yeah. get a, a much better sense of what the heck's really going on in the locker room. And I'm not sure it's good for good for these players. Uh, but, yeah, I, everything. There's a lot of drama and a lot of truths and, and, and you know, hot air that comes out of there. But, uh, yeah, it's, it's funny how much is not leaked out of this locker room until yeah. now. Yeah, well, now because the NFL knows it sells, you know, let's pull back the curtain, but not too much. But let's right. pull, but not too much. But let's pull back the curtain. Right. Um. So, so for all those early struggles for both of them, take me through as an older brother to see what happened in back to back years. Super Bowl forty one. Peyton finally puts everything to rest. Climate controlled quarterback. It rained the whole damn game. He wins the Super Bowl. He gets MVP. And the very next year, Eli and the Giants sneak into the playoffs and take down the unbeaten Patriots, even though they lost the final game of the regular season for them to go 16-0. and I've talked to Archie about this. In fact, I talked to him after the game in Glendale. What was it like as a older brother to see your two younger brothers do that in back-to-back years? Yeah, it was, I mean, it was unbelievable. I was just so proud of them. Um, yeah. You know, Peyton, they, they had been close. and knew the Colts were good. Um and I guess in some ways there was some relief there on Peyton's side to have, you know, just because they've been in the conversation so many times and just validation that, you know, all this, you know, can't win the big one junk is over put to bed. And, you know, he's, he's one of the greatest quarterbacks to ever play and just, you know, thank goodness, give him his, give him his notice. Eli and them, that was totally different because they, they were, they kind of got hot late. They beat a unbelievable Cowboys team, maybe the best Cowboys team we've seen in, in the last 30 years. They were loaded. Yeah. And then, um, you know, go up to Green Bay and, and sneak away. And then and then we're going to play the greatest team. We're 18-0. and 0. We were at Super Bowl week yeah. was the most relaxing week of all time because, like, hey, we shouldn't even be here. We're going to play right. this team. It's so much better than us. And, look, maybe we'll get back to one a while. Later. There's no chance we're going to win this thing. So let's just kind of enjoy the week and, you know, stress-free. And then to uh, – to, to sneak up and, and squeeze one out in that sort of fashion was just, that was unbelievable. I mean, just, you couldn't, you know, David Goliath, all the, all the, you know, the scenarios that you could, it just wasn't supposed to happen. And it was, it was phenomenal. I have a great picture of literally on the field after with Eli, we're, we're like, look like we're going to kiss. And, and I would just like look in each other's eyes, like a bunch of, like both of us, like, are you sure this happened? Did this really happen? And yeah. uh, I, I, you know, and then for them to go ahead and both of them win another one was just insane. Yeah. By the way, I'm glad you mentioned that Cowboys team because that team, I mean, in the first half of that game, they had two 90 plus yard touchdown drives. No team that's ever had two 90 yard touchdown drives up to that point had ever lost a playoff game before. Uh, yet the Giants found a way to, to pull that one out. Um, you know, we we talk. I've, I've talked to a lot of people about. Uh, about seeing those back-to-back games. And, and Peyton and Eli used to always say, I hated playing each other. We hated playing each other uh, in the regular season. What was it like as a big brother to watch those guys go against them, uh, each other? I, I didn't like it either. I didn't even go. My mom was like, y'all, you should go. You should support them. I didn't go to any of those games. I bagged yeah. it. They, it was kind of awkward for them. You didn't know whether to cheer or who to, how to do it. And so, um, yeah, I, 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 it was my least favorite opponent of all time and glad that was over with and just move on to the next week. No, thank you. Yeah. So when, when he, when Peyton was going through his struggles, you know, and he had the, the nerve damage in the neck, how much did you talk to him and how much, I mean, I'm just, cause you sort of went through that same, I mean, it was a different injury, but like yeah. how much did you talk to him about things that might or might not be? No, you know, not too much. Peyton, um, He's kind of self-sufficient. He leans on me for comedic advice and, uh, you know, is this, I got to do a, some, uh, you know, help me with this, or I got to roast someone, help me write that or this, that, and the other, but not too much emotional, uh, heavy stuff. He, I'm, right. I'm definitely the, the light, 
the light stuff, you know. Well, uh, that makes sense because the first time I ever met you in person, if I'm not mistaken, it was uh, the last Super Bowl in Houston, uh, and you were wearing a green suit and a hat with dollar signs all over it. It was uh, just seemed like the right thing to do, Trey. Yeah, I, I mean, I can't blame you. I, you can't hide money. Not you against it, it, no. You can't hide it. Well, especially when you're wearing it. Like, that was a thing. <laughs> you know, like you, were, I, it was, you were literally wearing it. Right. I had to walk around. It was that, it was whatever, media night. But I think it was the... Uh, it, it's, it's, it, that was still media day. Now it's become opening night, you know, right. the whole thing. Right. I needed some way to distinguish myself and at least... I had to go interview people. They sent me the, you know, a microphone and a camera guy and go, go get in front of anybody and ask them anything you want. I'm like, all right. Yeah. So I needed a little bit of a conversation starter. So uh, it, was a, it, was a, it was a terrific outfit. It fits like a glove. It would be money. There's no question about it. So, so with everything that Peyton went through and the, you know, the whole the, had to get rid of him, and I understand why the Colts let him go. With their, yeah. Andrew Luck was sitting there. How much fun was it uh, for the entire family after the beatdown in New York? 43 to eight, two years later to come back and see him gallop out the way they did in Super Bowl 50. Yeah. You don't get to write that sort of you know, no. your history. There. Very that, few. That, no. And it was unbelievable. 18 years. And, um, and I was, uh, it was fantastic. I had the whole family there and obviously, and, and everybody, my kids could really appreciate it. His kids could appreciate it. It was that point in his career where um, it was just the perfect send off. And so um, yeah. I'm, uh, I'm thrilled that's why he ended his NFL career, and he hadn't slowed down since. And uh, yeah, like literally, I think he was just booked for three more gigs. Which again, that's why I'm I'm boycotting Peyton Manning on this podcast because I, he's everywhere. He's he's too easy right now. He's just he's just too easy. I'm going to tell him, and he will be furious. So uh, yeah, of course. Someone should tell him he has children. You know, right. might want to see them every once in a while. <laughs> might want to yeah. just say hi to them. Just hey, I'm still here. Just want you to know I'm doing 73 different things. But yes, I acknowledge you guys. Um, and then the way Eli went out, right? Like there was like, okay, is he going to go somewhere else after this yeah. whole thing had come and gone? I loved his line. Uh, once a giant, always a giant, only a giant. You know, it was, it was, it was a shame that the giants were, had such success and then kind of, you know, fell off a little bit. They, they really, they prided themselves on having these great offensive lines and they were so good during Eli's age, you know, great running game and, just pound you and then play action and and then that kind of just faded and they never quite got it back and so um he went through a tough a tough run to to end it you know that but i think i think everybody uh always admired the way he never complained he never you know blamed someone else he just hung in there like a like a true pro and uh and i can i feel pretty confident that he's he's beloved around new york for that reason alone yeah, and uh, he's sort of been the 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 uh, lead on the Manning cast with the little jabs he gets at uh, at Peyton in almost every show. You know, it was funny. Uh, we were doing a little speaking engagement the other day, and it was just it was just Dad and Eli and I, and we were uh, and someone goes, uh, Archie, how would you describe Eli? And he goes, Dad, kind of hemming and hawing, and he goes, Well, you know, he didn't say much. You know, oh, Eli, I didn't think Eli got a personality. He was about 40. And I'm like, <laughs> I go, Eli, how old are you? He goes, 41. I went, yeah. nice work, Dad. So, you know, he has definitely come out of his shell. And uh, I like how he kind of doesn't always know the difference between right and wrong on, on the air. And um, yeah. I guess we're seeing a side of him that he probably couldn't display uh, in, front of the, in front of the camera, the microphone as a, as a player. So um, he's, he's hitting his stride. Well, listen, I got to give your dad all the credit in the world because I told him this line here because I used to do these these whenever Peyton wasn't playing in the Super Bowl, I would do this Gatorade appearance with Peyton and Art and Archie and, and Eli. And I always say, you know, the rest of the NFL loves you because if it weren't for you and Olivia, Tom Brady might have 12 of these things right now. And he I mean, sent me a clip of, about a year ago. He's like, had to use your line. He said, as <laughs> Trey Wingo once told me, you know, if Tom Brady might have 12 of these damn things if I didn't have two kids. Yeah, it's it's all Olivia. We all give give all yeah. the credit to mom. That's the way it works. But uh, no, that is that's a classic line. He he he's quoted you many on many occasions. So you're you're uh, you're, you're you're in good shape with Arch. They say if you reach one person, you've done your job. <laughs> and speaking of kids, we need to talk about the next phase of the Manning legacy. Why don't we take our second break? We'll come back with uh, Cooper Manning on Half Forgotten History right after this. 
As you said, you didn't get to play your career the way you wanted to. You lived it out to, through your, your two younger brothers who had stellar careers. And now along comes Arch. Uh, Arch Manning, your son. Uh, number one pocket passer in the NFL. I mean, excuse me, in high school and the recruiting, all that kind of stuff. He's committed to Texas. When did you know early on that Arch may be the next thing in this family? Well, our Arch um, always liked sports and playing outside. He never was a video game guy, kind of like we were wired. Yeah. Always get outside. You're bored. Go, go shoot hoops. Go, you know, yeah. I'll hit you fly balls. And so, um, you know, he got to play. And um, again, he sixth grade football, tackle football was the first time. But they played flag football and he threw a lot of touchdowns. I don't think they ever, you know, lost many games doing that. And then he had a fun uh, from coaches who recognized he could throw it early and let him throw it in middle school, not just toss it to the fastest, biggest guy. And so um, he was really lucky in that he um, he kind of came onto the high school scene and there was really not a, a quarterback uh, on the roster. So he got to start as a uh, as a true freshman, which you don't get that right. chance no matter yeah. what. If there's a senior there, you're just kind of a backup guy and come and see. So that was really neat. I, I can remember him coming out for the spring they have a, in New Orleans. I don't know everywhere else you have spring practice. So this is his eighth grade year of spring practice and you have a spring game kind of in spring practice of the game. And he had a really good day through a bunch of touchdowns. And then I remember, I think his first, first pass of his entire high school career was like a, you know, a 45 yard, you know, go route that went for 60, 70 yards. So he got off to a fast start and just, um, but he wasn't, He's 160 pounds, you know, like every other little 15 year old out there. So, um, you know, again, I, I always had a feeling he, he was he could throw it pretty well. Um, but I don't know if everybody else always noticed or I didn't want to be the guy who was trying to, you know, point more attention to him. I was trying to um, kind of keep things relatively normal because I, I had a sense that it might get a little nutty after a while. Right. Well, especially, like you said, how much different recruiting is now to when you were, were being recruited. How, how much sort of parental sort of arm embracing did you have to do to make sure, hey, guys, let's let's just pump the brakes here a little bit? Well, the school did a good job of it, too. And the coach uh, said, look, let's just let's let this you, this could get way out of hand in a real hurry, in a hurry. And plus, you also didn't want to bring so much attention to him where if it didn't work out, it was like he's right. a bust before he's, you know, hit puberty. It's just it's just yeah. kind of silly for people to try to get too much attention. Oh, I'm in eighth grade. I got an offer. Well, that's not a good idea. Just just keep quiet about it. Right. You can't do anything with it for five more years. So, um, right. I you know, I always thought he could throw it. He's a good athlete, and I'm glad he got he's getting a chance to to go try to play college and and, and have some fun. He's he's excited about Texas. That's where he wants to go to school. He's he's he loves the staff. He loves the guys on the team, and he got some really good guys coming with him. So I think there's a chance they could have a lot of fun. And um, and I, I'm excited he's excited. I'm glad you said that because, you know, we can't get the draft right, okay? Like half of the first round is going to be a bust. But you're telling me that when when we got a 15-year-old, oh, that kid, he's going. Like the, the, the draft and the high school ranking is not exactly an exact science. That is correct. That's why I, I wanted to, I, you know, look, we tried, my wife and I, we tried to keep it, just keep it normal. Let's have, have fun. High school is supposed to be fun. Do the best you can. Play with all these guys that are going to be your friends forever. Everybody's going to go on. I mean, he's not playing with a bunch of, you know, Division One guys. These guys, he's throwing to guys that are going to be dermatologists and, you know, corporate lawyers that are fun, that'll be, you know, his buddies forever. So let's enjoy this. It is what it is. He plays at a 2 A school. They play some other schools, but let's not try to get to somewhere too far down the road. Just, just kind of enjoy every day. So were you surprised in the end it was Texas for Arch? You know, I was just kind of the concierge. I, I really just booked flights, booked hotels yeah. and tried to hold his hand and say, what do you think about this? What do you think about that? He, he loved Nick Saban. He loved Kirby. He loved Sark. And those were the final three, um, you know, Alabama and Georgia got it going. I think part of a little bit of the appeal of Texas is that they've been in a little bit of a, uh, you know, been off a little bit the last several years. And so maybe being a part of something new and kind of 
cranking up something that hadn't been um, quite what it should be was was appealing to him. Um, but but you know those other places are so impressive that it's uh, they're they're machines. They are literally machines, yeah. and uh, he had good options. Is Texas back? Oh, I, you know I think also I said Arch, don't ever say that again. Tech, no one will ever. <laughs> I don't know. Whoever, just say we're we're here or we're not here. I mean we're back is such yeah. a is such an inviting moment to to cr- criticize. So um, no, they got they got some work to do, and I think he's uh, he's ready to go to work. Yeah. Um, what advice are you going to give him when he uh, when he ships off for his first uh, for his first uh, sort of days at school? You know, he's going. He's graduated early, which is I think he's the first person ever in Newman history to graduate early. He went to summer school, took three summer school classes before his junior year, three before his senior year, just to give him the flexibility. His mother is not happy about you know robbing her of yeah. these last you know six months of high school. My right. Baby. She is. Um, I told him. I told him to be really close friends with the trainer, really close friends with the uh, equipment guys, and uh, be nice to his teachers. That's all I said. And go to class. Yeah. Perfect. Yeah. Occasionally. Yeah. I don't know many. I, I, I went to Baylor. Okay. We went to UT a lot. I don't know how anybody graduates. Just say that right now. I don't know how anybody graduates from the University of Texas. 65,000 undergrads, uh, a, an incredibly ridiculous political climate uh, for the state government, the University of Texas, and a thriving arts community and beautiful lakes and and rolling hills. Like, God bless him if he just gets out of it. Uh, Ellen and I are looking to re-enroll. We're going to go ahead and give us some, some graduate studies. Yeah. Some, uh, we're going to give our best best effort. We're, I think we're going to have more fun than he is. Speaking of that, by the way, uh, uh, when we did have Eli on the podcast, he said you used to, you used to go around and tell people at Oxford you were Eli – and he'd be like, "Hey, why are you?" He'd get the next day, he'd be like, "Why, Eli? Why were you out on a Friday night before a game? I mean, What's going it's on?" It's amazing man? how hungover Eli played so many nights, so many afternoons and Saturdays. <laughs> you know, I was just trying to support my brother the best I could. I didn't. I had a reputation to protect. So I go ahead and ruin his. Yeah, smart. Uh, so, who's the funniest of the three of you? Yeah, a comedian standoff because everyone thought it was Peyton, right? Because he got all the sure. commercials and all that kind of stuff. Then, as you, as Archie said, we didn't find out Eli had a personality until he tried to try out for Penn State. And then there's you, who's been making people laugh for about five or six years now. Uh, you know, everybody's got their own taste. I'm sure um, there's a there's a there's a moment there for everybody. Um, I would I would like to think I might have a nod in that department, but you know, it's it's you know, depends who the audience is. You know, something inappropriate is probably more. They don't have the my wheelhouse. You know. Yeah. They they don't have the suit though. They don't have the green money well, suit. That's right. Baby. I might yeah, I think that thing is a, it's a solid fifty two, you know, short. It's perfect yeah. for you. I'll lend it to you. And the hat was also the hat yeah. with the outfit was I don't also know where that hat came from. It made the whole you know whole I, it's ensemble. very you'd be surprised, but um we have an entire costume closet. The whole entire attic is nothing. Oh, I'm not price. surprised about it's that. Halloween, they will like, be that is that is the least surprising thing I've there'll heard. There'll be thirty kids coming over, like, "Hey, do you have a uh, you know French maid or a uh, priest?" I mean, I, <laughs> whoa, whoa, whoa! Don't need to know. Yeah. Do not need it's, to know. Um, we got it for you, buddy. Just just say the word. Yeah. Hashtag feather duster. All right, we're good. Uh, Kupa. We appreciate you being with us. Uh, all the best to you. And oh, by the way, I think Peyton just got bit, uh, he got booked for a, a Santa appearance, a winter carnival, and a high school graduation. So uh, he might be a little yeah, busy. The hardest working man in show business, baby. E- easiest get in the world. Cooper, we appreciate you thanks, being Trey. with us. Thanks, Trey. Really, really enjoyed it. A lot of fun. So thanks once again to Cooper Manning uh, for joining us. Finally, nice to see him getting his shine after all those years having to watch Peyton and Eli do all those things in the NFL that he never got a chance to do. And more importantly, thanks to you for watching another episode and another season of Half Forgotten History. That's a wrap for this season, but we're coming back next year. We hope you'll come back with us. A special thanks to our sponsor this year, Mercedes-Benz Sprinter Vans. Uh, Check one out. You won't be disappointed uh, if you get your hands on one. So thanks, everyone, for tuning in and watching and listening. And we got a whole new season coming up in 2023 real soon.